We've always had life insurance. You can always get insurance. I'm going to say. Okay. Thanks. If everyone will make their way back to their seats, we're going to continue with the presentation. I'm good. Should I wait until they're seated or go ahead? So our next presenter is my very special roommate, Katie Marascio. <laughs> She's going to give us some local food. Yeah. Yay. 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 I'll just wait until everyone's sitting down before I start. So my name is Katie Marascio. The title of my project is Local Food for Thought. I'd like to begin with two statements. One, everyone eats food. And two, everyone will always eat food. <laughs> Throughout human history, the means of acquiring that food has stayed pretty constant. People ate what they grew, hunted, or gathered themselves, which meant that their food came from a fairly localized area. As a result, people used the land in a way that was sustainable so that they could feed society for generations. Here on the Colorado Plateau, that meant conservative water usage and growing crops and raising livestock that were well adapted to the arid region. These practices have changed within the past 500 years or so. And so my goal for this project was to investigate how and why the development of food production on the Colorado Plateau has changed so much from the established sustainable methods and how those changes through time have affected the people of the era. The first era that I'm going to focus on is before Spanish exploration, which is before 1540 and focusing on the Hopi and Navajo. Next is after Spanish exploration. The Spanish, when they came to the Colorado Plateau, introduced foreign, non-adapted crops and livestock. Next were the Mormon settlers and the cowboys. They brought with them new land use practices and food, especially canned and dry food that came over on the railroad. By this time in the late 1800s, the distance from individuals and their food sources was the farthest it had ever been, but food was still cheap and accessible, so it was of no concern. In the beginning of the 19, 1900s, the two world wars broke out, uh, which meant that factories started being developed in order to make munitions, etc. After the wars, food acquisition was still driven by the time efficiency and um, an economic convenience that it was before the wars, but with the factory infrastructure and mindset in place in our society, those two paired up and factory farm food became the norm. So back to those two statements, everyone eats food and everyone will always eat food. These, the changes in food production and accessibility caused by the colonization and development have exacerbated the disconnect between people and their food sources on the Colorado Plateau, which has degraded their environment and sustainability of these food sources. The second statement is especially important when we realize that the historic changes in food production become important to us now, and that the sustainability of our current food production is imperative to our future. In order to really understand how changes in food production have affected the people, as supplement to my book research, I spent a week eating chronologically through time at the, of the different eras, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> now, and so each day represented a different era in the, the timeline. The first day was before Spanish, Spanish explor exploration. Second day was after Spanish exploration. Third day represented the food the Mormon settlers would have eaten. Fourth day was what cowboys would have eaten. Fifth day was modern factory farmed food, so like super commercialized stuff. And the last two days were modern local food. Through this experiment, I could experience how the changes in food that happened within the, the past 500, 500 years, but on a much shorter time scale. Day one represented before Spanish colonization. The agricultural practices that the Hopi and Navajo implemented focused on a harmony between crops and crops and people and land. The three most essential crops were corn, squash, and beans, or the three sisters. The corn and beans, when grown together, the beans fix the nitrogen back into the soil that the corn depletes, and when eaten together, they form a complete protein. So it was really healthy and sustainable for them to be grown together. 
squash completes the trio, and they were and squash was planted in between the corn and the beans to keep the weeds out, so that the fields could be used over and over again to produce the highest yield. Each of these plants has well adapted to the arid region, but especially the corn. Now I want everyone to close their eyes and imagine like a typical cornfield in your head. You probably imagine something like this. The Hopi cornfields, however, look more like that. Hopi corn manages to grow in fields of sand because the corn has extra long roots to reach, to reach the water low in the ground, which is especially important in such an arid region. Without the chemical fertilizers and supplements that we have now available to modern Americans, the Hopi and Navajo farmers relied on well-adapted crops such as corn, squash, and beans to produce high enough fields to, field, to feed their society. As a result, I centered my meals that day around the three sisters. Breakfast was blue corn mush, which is like oatmeal, but made with blue corn, blue corn meal. Lunch was butternut squash soup, and dinner was baked sweet corn and pinto beans. The next day represented after Spanish colonization. The Spanish arrived in the mid 16th century and brought old world plants and animals with them, such as wheat, fruit, cattle, pigs, uh, chickens, goats, etc. If these new varieties could adapt to the arid region, they became incorporated into the diets of the people living there. My, my meals those days, that day, was blue corn pancakes for breakfast, which were made with wheat, so it was a marriage of the old, the traditional blue corn meal with the new wheat. Lunch was Navajo fried bread, which is made with wheat, and a bean corn tomato salad that represented some of the vegetables and the bean corn that was available to them. And dinner was green chili soup, made with pork, an introduced livestock. After the Spanish, it was only it was a few centuries before anyone else ventured to the Colorado Plateau, and the people that, those people that did were the Mormon settlers. The Mormon settlers arrived in the area in the late 1800s, and really only started to thrive in the region when they started to manipulate water. They implemented dams, irrigation channels, and reservoirs in order to raise livestock and to water fields such as this one, large orchards of fruit trees that normally wouldn't be able to grow in the region except for with this large amount of water that they, the Mormons channeled to the fields. The railroad also brought canned goods and dry goods over with them, which made the Mormon lifestyle much easier because they had food that would last longer and, they, and it was a wider variety of food. So as a Mormon settler, I had pioneer hardtack with fruit preserves for breakfast. The Mormon settlers, settlers would have preserved the fruit themselves and they would, it would last over winter and then they would have fruit when things couldn't grow, etc. For lunch, I had split pea soup with pork sausage balls. And for dinner, I had something called St. Jacob's soup, soup, which is a pork, potato, onion, and tomato stew. The Mormons only really could survive as well as they did with partial independence from locally produced food brought over on the railroad. This meant out-of-season food was being introduced into their diets, and the resulting environmental uh, repercussions were soon becoming much more evident as time progressed. <coughs> and currently, with the Mormons, uh, cowboy cattle operations came to the, the Southwest. Their meals focused on hearty, filling meals because they had a very mobile lifestyle, but it was, they were very hardworking. The canned food and dry goods from the railroad were also used by the cowboys, and they also the cowboys had an easy supply of beef. Clearly, um, and neither both of them were con very convenient, but neither of them was sustainable. The railroad emitted coal fumes as you know went to the west, and it committed coal fumes into the atmosphere. And the cattle was not natural to the ecosystem. What the cowboys would do is that they would put a large amount of cattle in a single area to get the most grazing possible. But this overstocking led to widespread deterioration of grassland productivity, and it has been long-term. We're still feeling the effects of that. You can see in this photo taken at Diablo Trust that in the foreground, there is reduced biodiversity in the field. Cows are just there, though that's moderate intensity grazing, but this is kind of an example of what it would look like. I wanted to model the monotony of the cowboy diet, so <laughs> my was focused on pinto beans. Breakfast, pinto beans and biscuits. Lunch, pinto beans and rice. Dinner. Pinto beans and cornbread. Um, so I brought samples of cornbread for you. It's blue corn, blue corn, cornbread. And so you can get a taste of the, the Colorado Plateau and the cowboy influence. And GCS volunteers are gonna pass that out to you. Um, yeah, take it if you want one. The environmental impacts from the food brought over on the railroad and the cattle herds 
um, were either ignored or unstudied. And this paved the way for the advent of a modern American food industry that is more concerned with market demand for convenience rather than environmental externalities. So at the beginning of the 19th century, when the war started and ended, um, there was still the factory development. So the factory mindset and infrastructure influenced many aspects of American life, but especially the food industry. With the factory mindset, food production became about producing food that was cheap, for uniform, uniform food for the cheapest price, which when applied vast on a large scale, had really unintended consequences that have lasted until today. A good, a good example is McDonald's and the hamburger. Because McDonald's is one of the largest beef purchasers in our country, when McDonald's decides that they want a hamburger patty that tastes the same, looks the same, smells the same, is the same anywhere you purchase it, they, change, they radically change how ground beef is produced in our country. There's this dramatic concentration of, of beef production, and that increases the shipping distance from the slaughterhouse to the grocery store to your kitchen, which increases the environmental impact. On the Colorado Plateau, drought-hardy, heat-tolerant sustainable crops have been abandoned in favor of large monoculture fields, monoculture fields that require floods of water to irrigate the crops, which is unsustainable to the region and normally would not be able to happen unless they had these, this manipulation of water, but it's not sustainable. We can't, we can't keep doing this forever. So my meals on day five <laughs> try to represent the greatest distance possible between me and my food sources. Breakfast was Lucky Charms, lunch was the classic McDonald's Big Mac, and dinner was a TV dinner. As the food industry continues to try and make food just as convenient as possible, they slip further and further into a sustainability crisis. On a regional scale, people, farmers and ranchers and consumers who are concerned with this are taking things into their own hands. So day six represents modern, local, commercialized food, people who want to push back. On the Colorado Plateau, ranchers are reintroducing moderate intensity grazing practices in order to increase biodiversity and productivity of the grasslands. They also are engaging in selective breeding so that each year, each successive year's herd is more and more adapted to the region. The farmers are starting to introduce more heritage crops into their fields or new farms are starting with only heritage crops. There are also businesses on the Colorado Plateau that, especially Flagstaff, that are becoming more and more popular as they purchase locally grown products and they're becoming more and more of them. One such example is Local Alternative, which is a catering company that purchases only local foods then, and then creates delicious meals out of them. Every month, Local Alternative Catering also creates, has created a supper club where they take local foods and make a dinner that anyone can have. Well, they purchase. My meals this day uh, were all from local businesses that source some or all of their foods from local producers. Breakfast was local favorite Macy's mm -hmm. coffee, lunch was Diablo Burger, and dinner was Brick's Restaurant and Wine Bar. So all these places do, mostly these two, do their best to find local ingredients, but Macy's does try a little bit and everybody loves them. <laughs> the avenues through which people can access local foods themselves directly are also cropping up more and more. The, the CS in Flagstaff, the CSA, or Community Supported Agriculture and Farmers Market are some such avenues. The CSA is a business where you can purchase a share and then pr collect local fresh produce weekly or bi-weekly. And the Farmers Market is a place where local producers can engage directly with you one-on-one -on -one to give you what you want. These two methods decrease transportation costs and the detriment detrimental effects on the environment. Because the farmer's market was closed when I did my shopping for this day, it was all purchased from the CSA. Breakfast was egg white omelet, lunch was roasted beets and finger wing potatoes eaten with pinto beans and garlic bread. Pinto beans were left over from before. <laughs> <laughs> and dinner was roasted root vegetable stew. With the increased accessibility of local food such, from places such as Diablo Burger, CSA, and the farmer's market, more people will have the ability to buy this local food. There's a growing community that's pushing back on the factory farm food, showing that there is a concern for the, the integrity and the environmental repercussions of their food. The history of food acquisition has mostly been driven by accessibility, but nowadays, easy, fast, and cheap are the buzzwords of our food industry. 
people purchase this factory farm food because it is what is accessible. But if local food was made as accessible as factory farm food, the fresher taste and the, less, the lesser environmental impacts will increase consumers to purchase local food. While we wait for the government to make the necessary changes, community members can start this process now with the power of consumer demand. When you're at the grocery store, buy the local option and realize that the increased price re reflects the true environmental cost of what you're purchasing. Or go to directly to the farmer's market or the CSA to get your food and, um, and avoid the middleman of the grocery store completely, reducing the transportation costs even more. Lastly, you can go out to, to eat at restaurants or other places that get their food from local producers and support businesses that have the same, the same ethics and values of sustainability and environmental responsibility that you do. Every time you buy food, you are voting for change with that, per, with that purchase. And returning to the two statements I made earlier, everyone eats food and everyone will always eat food. The sheer amount of food purchased by every person every day for every meal re reflects a huge, a massive number of votes. If we can harness that power, we can change our food industry back into a sustainable, responsible system. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. I'm, I'm just really curious to hear about your reactions to the different days of eating. Like, so, your, yeah. in the beginning of the week when I was eating lots of corn and beans, um, my digestive system really reacted strongly to that. It was a lot of uh, food that I hadn't been eating, and it was a lot of the same food over and over again. Um, but I felt fine. And then the, the, the day that I really noticed it was the day that I had um, modern commercialized food. And um, I'm normally veg mostly vegetarian, so eating all that meat was weird, but also I was so d disappointed by McDonald's. Like, because as a kid, I had this image in my mind of so delicious, the best fries ever. I can't ever go there because it's unhealthy, but I'll still love it. And then I went there, and it was terrible. Like, why does, I don't know why people keep going back to it. I just didn't understand. But it's possible that I came into it with the bias that I already have. Like, I like yeah. local organic food that tastes better. It's fresher. You looked forward to that big for a long time. I did. I thought it was going to be so good. <laughs> Explain. So was it any of those days that you felt like, I did those people so far. I'm starving. Um, I think the, mm, I think it was either the first or second day when I just had kind of carbs for breakfast. I think I had just blue corn pancakes for breakfast the second day, and I probably had agave nectar on them and maybe some fruit, but I mean, I didn't feel very full, um, and I got hungry pretty fast, but it's possible that they would have had some sort of like jerky with it or something, but I didn't. Yes. Do you find that that's a worth that that week, or you can extend it, um, is a worthwhile experiment for most people in most areas of the modernized world where we are more disconnected? It depends on what you're searching for and what you're attempting to gain by doing a week like that. Um, ultimately, I think that I really I just gained like kind of an appreciation for all the work that goes into making a different meal every day or for every meal. Um, and it was nice to see the progression through time, but if you're not interested in that, then it would just be kind of like, eh. But I think it'd be really interesting for people who are less concerned with history and more concerned with like what they can do now is to have a week only eating, only eating local foods and see like how expensive it is, how inaccessible it is to get those foods, and, um, and how much different your diet will be because foods are completely different if you eat seasonally. So like the 100 mile diet or something? Yeah. yeah. Yes? Two questions. Mm -hmm. um, is, I, I don't know if it's Diablo. Oh, sorry, I mentioned that a little bit earlier, but um, so Diablo Trust is two ranches that formed a trust together, and they sell their grass-fed beef to Diablo Burger, which purchases these these hamburger makes hamburger patties out of this purchased beef. So it's local beef, and they get all their they get most of their produce from within Arizona. Um, so it's they're trying their best to make the most sustainable local business, and it's interesting that they only take cash because if they're trying they try only to have local interactions with businesses and most credit card companies aren't from Arizona so it's not local and so they don't take cash yeah. my second question is um, when you're looking at, at eating locally and sustainable food how do you think that's going to integrate with the lower income people who are, can't afford that mm -hmm. um, that's the problem is that 
factory farmed food is so cheap, but it's dishonestly cheap because it doesn't cost significantly more to grow beef closer to home, but there are government subsidies that pay for the feed for the cows. And so that's cheaper and so you don't have to pay for that. Um, and it, making it more accessible is something that's really important. And so when I was talking to the director of the community supported agriculture store, she was telling me how they have a, they take food stamps there. And they take, um, and so they have also a lot of kind of scholarships where community members purchase a share and then that share is given to someone who can't pay for it. And so it's kind of, um, it's a two way street, but it, it really shouldn't be that much more expensive. Like that should be the way to go. That's how it was. It's just the government subsidies that make it so cheap. Okay. Any questions? Any more questions? Okay, thanks. Uh, next is Selene. She's doing her